The following program contains content that some of our viewers may find disturbing or triggering. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Well, hello there. Thank you for joining me for this week's edition of Tell Ill 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook. This week, April is Autism Month, so I'm going to sit down with Natalie Stevens, the support coordinator for the Autism Nova Scotia chapter serving the Strait area. And we also have footage from two recent Autism Acceptance Day ceremonies that took place in Arishat and Port Hawkesbury over the weekend. Later on, I'll visit the Marine Research Center at the Université St. Anne campus in Petit de Gras, and I'll talk to the folks over there about how recent funding from two levels of government and a fisheries group in Pictou County is helping the center to expand its research activities. But we begin this week with the difficult story of the suspension of Richmond Municipal Councillor Michael Digden from all council activities taking place throughout the month of April. Here at Tillil Community Television, we realize that this is a sensitive story with many moving parts, and we are going to do our best to cover the story in a balanced, fair, and sensitive manner that respects all persons involved. We have extended interview requests to Councillor Digden himself, as well as to the person who brought forth the accusations against him that led to his suspension, Jessica Forgeron. As of our final news deadline at 1 p.m. on Wednesday afternoon, April the 6th, Forgeron had not responded to an interview request from Telil Community Television, and Councillor Digden had informed Telil Community Television that, for the time being, he will refer people to his original statement on the situation, in which he makes clear that he is aware of the accusations brought before him of a breach of the Municipal Code of Conduct, and that he is aware that the situation is also under investigation by Richmond County's municipal solicitors. So, instead, we are going to proceed right now to the special meeting that was held by Richmond Council on Monday, March 28th, at which Michael Digden's potential suspension came up as a formal motion to be voted on by the rest of Council. So here is Deputy Warden Melanie Sampson with that motion from the special Council meeting of March 28th. I move that whereas an allegation of a breach of the Municipal's Code of Conduct by Councillor Michael Digden was made by a member of the public, whereas the alleged breach was investigated by Council as stipulated by the Municipal Code of Conduct, whereas it was determined by Council that Councillor Michael Digden did breach the Code of Conduct by failing to observe a high standard of morality in his conduct of his official duties, failing to observe a high standard of professionalism in his dealings with members of the broader community and failing to perform the functions of his office with integrity. Be it resolved that Councillor Michael Digden shall be subject to the following corrective action, which is commensurate with the nature and severity of the breach. A, Councillor Digden shall write an apology to the member of the public and such apology shall be delivered by the warden. B, Councillor Digden shall undergo sensitivity training agreed upon by council, which shall be completed no later than September 30th, 2022, at the expense of the councillor. C, Councillor Digden shall be restricted from attending regular council meetings and committees of council meetings for the month of April, 2022. So there you are. That is the motion of council that was unanimously approved by all participating councillors during the March 28th special meeting of Richmond Council held on Zoom early in that last week of March. Now, there's not a lot of detail we can go into because we don't have the participation of the two people at the center of this suspension. What we can tell you, because both parties have confirmed this to two other media outlets here in Cape Breton Island, that the cause of the accusation that was brought forward by Jessica Forgeron was a number of text messages and messages sent on the Facebook Messenger app that Councillor Digden made to Forgeron over the course of several months between April and November of 2021. 
What we can do for you now is talk a little bit about the nature of the suspension and the actions taken against Councillor Digden by Municipal Council here in Richmond County. In another interview given to another Cape Breton media outlet, Councillor Digden himself has described his suspension as, quote, a little harsh. Others have suggested that the suspension does not go far enough, nor does the action taken against Councillor Digden by Richmond Council. So, how can we sort all this out in terms of Richmond Council's Code of Conduct and also in terms of the leeway given to Council to act on such incidents by Nova Scotia's Municipal Government Act? To get the answers and to get her thoughts on this whole situation, I spoke to Richmond Warden Amanda Mumberkett. Here is her interview with Telil 24-7 from earlier this week. And joining us to discuss the situation involving the suspension of Councillor Michael Digden is the Warden of Richmond County, Amanda Mumberkett. Uh, Warden Mumberkett, thank you for joining us on Tell Hill 24-7. Hi, Adam. Great to be here. Thank you. We appreciate you taking some time to walk us through this. And a big reason that we did want to bring you into the discussion is to give our viewers a sense of what happens when a complaint is launched against a municipal councillor like the one that was launched against Councillor Digden. So basically what happens when a complaint comes forward like the one you folks received? Sure. So, I mean, Richmond County Council uh, several years ago adopted a code of conduct. And, you know, certainly um, there's been, you know, Richmond County has had its share of tumultuous times at the council table. So obviously a previous council felt that a code of conduct was in order. Um, it outlines our responsibilities, including things like our conduct at meetings, obligations to our citizens. It you know, talks about use of public property, property, release of confidential information, interpersonal behavior. There's a whole list of expectations, I guess I will call them, in that code. Um, you know, it does go on to, to say that if a breach uh, is reported to the code of conduct, that uh, the next step is for council to conduct an investigation. And if a breach is determined, then it, it, it lets us know that we can impose corrective action. Uh, so that's essentially any time a breach uh, of the code of conduct is reported, that is essentially the process that, that we would take, um, you know, and councils, municipalities are essentially independent body. And so as an elected council, it's our responsibility to, to look into matters that, that, you know, would potentially uh, be uh, interpreted as a, as a breach of that code. Yours was a concern, not just that procedure is followed, but that the safety and security of the individual that brought the complaint forward was top of mind as well. Is that the case? Absolutely. I, I would say any time a constituent is in a position where they feel they need to report a breach uh, by a counselor to a code of conduct, um, our, our primary concern must be the constituent and making sure that that person feels confident in being able to bring his or her concerns forward, right? Um, that's That needs to be our, our number one concern um, and uh, and the protection of that person's privacy needs to be, you know, needs to be our, our also our number one concern. So um, so definitely um, I would say that that is kind of the, the philosophical place that, that I started from and I think that all of council started from in the, in the, in the conversation. Can I ask you basically what Councillor Digden will be allowed to do and not allowed to do over the month of April? And my understanding based on the motion that was brought forward by the Deputy Warden at the Special Council meeting of March 28th is that he will not be allowed to participate in either public council meetings, committee of the whole or regular meeting, in addition to committees of council does he have any other leeway to participate in, for example, budgetary discussions, uh, anything that is not considered a specific meeting of council or committee meeting of council? Essentially, what does Councillor Digden have the leeway to do at this point? Yeah, so there was there were actually several sanctions that were uh, put forward. And so the first was that uh, there would be a written apology to the member of the public um, and that uh, there would be some training involved, some sensitivity training as well that, that would be required. Um, and then there was also the uh, restriction from uh, regular council meetings and committees of council meetings for the month of April. So uh, to your point, Adam, uh, Councillor Digden is a democratically elected official for District 2, 
Richmond County. He is going to be expected to uphold all of the duties to his constituents that he normally would, uh, with the exception for the month of April, he will not be uh, able to bring, uh, you know, to, to be at the council table or at committee tables. Um, and, and, you know, and issues that would need to come to council or committees are going to have to be uh, forwarded by him to me or to another councillor to bring forward. Um, so, you know, anytime when council is meeting, whether it's budget, whether it's, uh, you know, committee of the whole, that, that is not going to be something that Councillor Digim is going to be permitted to do during the month of April. The code of conduct doesn't seem to have any leeway beyond that in terms of being able to bring in further discipline, including suspension without pay or suspension involving the potential declaration of the council seat to be vacant. Can you give our viewers a sense of what the municipality of Richmond County has in terms of leeway through its code of conduct and where it would need to go if it were going beyond that to these more difficult steps uh, if that were warranted in any future case. Yeah, and, and I know, you know, that question has been asked, um, you know, in this situation, past situations, and, you know, the answer really boils down to the fact that the Municipal Government Act, we call the MGA, it really doesn't make any reference um, you know, to a council's ability or, or the minister's ability to remove a councillor from his or her seat, um, aside from really absence of, at meetings, you know, and, and so as a result, because the Municipal Government Act doesn't allow for that, neither can our code of conduct. So based on the legal advice that we've received, the only re really, you know, way to have a municipal council removed would be to do so through the Municipal Conflicts of Interest Act, which requires, I think, a court application to do so and absolutely does not apply in this case. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't be even be able to speak to whether or not that's ever actually been done in Nova Scotia. I'm sure there's a case somewhere, but um, certainly would not apply in this case. The MGA is, you know, it, it recognizes that municipalities are independent bodies. I believe there's a gap here, you know, and, and I think that it's long recognized that there's been a gap in the MGA and as a result in the codes of conduct that municipalities have adopted because there's no there's no real um, clarity um, there's no uh, real authority in them to be able for councils to be able to take action or even for the for municipal affairs or the minister to take action when ex, you, know, ex, you know circumstances arise and so um, you know that's something that we've had to balance. Um, there's no legislative authority for us to even really have a code of conduct policy, let alone to remove a counselor or withhold stipends or any other sanctions. But that being said, obviously, Richmond has had a code of conduct policy because it was determined by past councils that it was needed. And I would agree with them. Um, but and, you know, I guess technically because it was in place when we were elected, we can rely on it to provide us with that guidance on how to proceed because we were all aware that that code existed when we were elected and, and uh, as sitting councillors. But to try to go outside of that or to go outside of the MGA, we really wouldn't have um, a legal leg to stand on. Now, this question I ask, knowing that the response I get comes from yourself as the warden of Richmond County and the member for District 4, and does not speak for the entire municipal council, but I'll ask it anyway, do you feel that there could be some conversation to be held between the municipality and other municipalities for that matter who have gone through similar situations and the Department of Municipal Affairs or the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities or both to try to reduce the gap between who can be held accountable and in what fashion uh, based on uh, what you've seen here? Is, is there a thought that you have on whether these discussions ought to be happening independently of what's going on with Councillor Digden this month? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, council has discussed it a number of times over the last year and a half that we may need to look at changing our code of conduct. In fact, uh, probably more than a year ago, the province set up a code of conduct working group, um, and they are anticipating having draft uh, articles finished by I think at the end of this year. Um, so you know, it's definitely been on the minds of of many many uh, municipalities. It's been on the minds of municipal affairs. I know at uh, the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities, it comes up as a regular topic. Uh, and I believe there's a, there's a local mayor from Nova Scotia who's chairing that working group. They are working through it, but it's, you know, it is definitely something that um, it's a complicated matter because, you know, we do need to remember when people are democrat democratically elected, um, you know, we don't really have 
the authority to override the decision of the people, uh, you know, unless there is some really strong, uh, you know, some really strong circumstance around it. And so finding that, um, you know, finding that balance, like I said before, but making sure that it, it you know, there are no unintended consequences uh, for other situations as they arise is really tricky. So, I'm, you know, I'm really hopeful that that working group is going to come up with a set of articles that are going to be helpful to municipalities that will help us standardize across the province what codes of conduct look like, what the, you know, consequences of breaching them will be, what the expectations of councillors uh, are within within those codes. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then I think what you'll see is municipalities like Richmond who have codes of conduct will look at, uh, we will absolutely be looking at aligning our code with the provincial regulations once they're released. The simple math dictates that when you lose one member of a five-person council for a month, uh, then you have four people to work with. Uh, are you optimistic that the four of you will be able to conduct council business in a reasonable fashion and be able to get through this next few weeks uh, without your fifth councillor? We've got a fantastic, you know, really strong staff supporting us. We've got um, you know, with really strong counselors around the table and, and, you know, the citizens of Richmond County don't need to be, they don't need to be worried that the work's not going to get done. We are absolutely doing, doing the work that's necessary to move our council forward. You see our strategic planning activities are, are well underway. We're, you know, our, our draft accessibility plan is uh, just about done. And um, so we are, we are absolutely moving forward. Do you have any personal reaction to the nature of the allegations that occurred and the suspension of the councillor for District 2 that resulted? Any final thoughts about all of this? You know, right from the time that we became aware of, of the, you know, the reported breach, I, I will say council took the matter very seriously. Um, and, and I know it sounds like an odd thing, but I'm really proud of them for upholding the code of conduct. Um, yes, it's a document that needs improvements, but it's the best we have to work with right now. This has been a difficult situation for everyone, um, and uh, all of the councillors acted professionally as we went through the process. I'm hoping that this is a learning moment also for all of us, um, and that we will, we will all do better uh, as we go forward. This is not an easy conversation to have. We appreciate you giving us some time to be able to walk us all through this. Uh, thank you, Warden Amanda Mubriquette, for joining us on Tell Hill 24-7 today. You're welcome. We're now going to shift away from this issue, but you're going to hear more from Warden Amanda Mubriquette in just a few moments. That's because she headed up one of two flag-raising ceremonies that took place over the past weekend to celebrate World Autism Acceptance Day in Richmond County and Port Hawkesbury. We're going to get to the footage from the Port Hawkesbury ceremony in just a moment, but first, here is Warden Mumbriquet with the Richmond County flag raising for World Autism Acceptance Day. I want to thank everyone for coming together uh, today to recognize World Autism uh, Acceptance Month. I think this is a, a wonderful gesture uh, for you all to be here, and as uh, Municipal Council, I know we were really happy to be able to do this. This is kind of... I think this is like our first flag raising ceremony, really. So lots of lots of ground being broken here today. We recognize how important it is to to understand the uh, the challenges and and the rewards uh, of people who are uh, who are living with autism every day, and and the people who are parts of their families and friends and support networks. Uh, it's estimated that one in 66 people across the country are on the autism spectrum. This month of April marks Autism Acceptance Month, and Saturday, April 2nd, marks, is marked World Autism Acceptance Day. We hope that our community will join, in the, will join those in the autism community across the globe and come together as a community to celebrate autism and to promote acceptance and inclusion throughout the province and throughout the world. And with a strong gust of wind, perfect for flag flying weather, Warden Amanda Mubriquet helped to raise the autism flag in front of the municipal building in Arishat. There it goes. As you can hear, Richmond County's first official municipal flag raising drew awesome. a great response from those in attendance. Thank you so much. I'm so happy 
happy we were able to do this. It's exciting for me, exciting for council. Thank you so much for being here. And a special shout out, of course, to Natalie and Felicia and all the folks who work to improve our accessibility and inclusion and to celebrate autism in our, com in our communities. By the way, the Natalie that Warden Mubberkett just mentioned is Natalie Stevens. She is the support coordinator for the Street Area Regional Council of Autism Nova Scotia. And while the flag raising was happening during the noon hour in Arishat, Stevens and her colleagues, including Deputy Mayor Jason O'Coin in Port Hawkesbury, were preparing a similar ceremony at the Port Hawkesbury Civic Centre. Whereas it is estimated that one in 66 people across the country are on the autism spectrum, and one in 34 people, approximately 30,000 individuals in Nova Scotia are on the, on the same autism spectrum. And whereas many dedicated autistic individuals, people, in, people with autism, parents, teachers, researchers, and professionals, including those at Autism Nova Scotia and other community-based organizations work tirelessly through our province to make the communities where we live accessible and inclusive for autistics, individuals with autism, and their loved ones. And whereas with 11 locations throughout the province and with the support of the autism community, Autism Nova Scotia builds understanding, acceptance, and inclusion for autistics, individuals on this autism spectrum, and their families throughout leadership, advocacy, education, training, and programming across the lifespan. And whereas this month of April marks Autism Acceptance Month, on Saturday, April 2nd, marked World Autism Acceptance Day, when people across the globe come together as a community to celebrate, celebrate autism and promote acceptance and inclusion. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Jason O'Coin, Deputy Mayor of Port Hawkesbury, on behalf of the Port Hawkesbury Council, do hereby proclaim April 2022 as Autism Acceptance Month throughout Port Hawkesbury and the Strait Area, and encourage all of our citizens to recognize the autistic individual, people with autism, family members, caregivers, educators, and other professionals who strive to make Nova Scotia an inclusive an accessible place for us all to call home. Our chapter encompasses Antigonish, Guysboro, Inverness, and Richmond counties. I also have a nine-year-old daughter on the spectrum, so advocating, supporting, and working with the autism community is near and dear to my heart. Um, our chapter has some great things planned for this month. Uh, first, of course, starting with today's event, I'd like to thank all the communities that are flying our flag today, Antigonish, St. Peter's, Guysboro, uh, I'd like to thank Warden Amanda Mumbercat for hosting an event in Airshot today. And, of course, we're here in Port Hawkesbury with Deputy Mayor Jason O'Coy. And as promised, we'll hear more discussion on Autism Month activities with Natalie Stevens of the Straight Area Chapter of Autism Nova Scotia later on in Tel 24-7. Right now, let's head to Petit de Gras, and specifically to the Marine Research Centre at the Isle Madame campus of Université Saint Anne. The centre recently received a major financial influx from two levels of government and from a Pictou County fishery group. The two levels of government were the federal government contributing $127,000 through OCOA and Nova Scotia's Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture, which contributed $100,000 to the Marine Research Centre, and as well, the Northumberland Fisheries Association contributed $100,000 in equipment and other essentials to help the Marine Research Centre expand what it's currently doing with regards to lobsters and other sea creatures. So I'm going to speak to Michelle Terrio, the director of the Marine Research Centre, and Associate Professor Daniel Lane about what this funding commitment means for the centre and what its current and future activities will look like. Here's that interview right now. It's a project that we've worked on here for several years. I know it was just a recent announcement, but it's been at least two years, maybe more, that we've had this in the back of our mind. And um, it was really based on the idea that we have a facility here, and we've been here for probably 10 years or more. And our facility, we've done a lot of great work over the years, but our facility was aging, and we were really in need of some upgrades to like the building and the infrastructure and you know the utilities for it so that we could 
kind of expand on the services that we offer for the industry. And we wondered a long time about how we could make that happen and how to do it. And um, we actually, it, this whole new project this, uh, kind of started with a donation that we received. And that was really the kicking point for this um, investment. And it was a donation from a fishing association in Nova Scotia that operated a lobster hatchery for about 10 years. And it was self self funded, and the fishermen, you know, funded the hatchery, and you know, released the lobster into the into their fishing area, uh, and they did that for quite a while, and then they, they they just realized that they they couldn't keep it going, or they didn't need to keep going, so they were closing it. So they contacted us and asked if we were interested in the hatchery, and um, they were offering it to us as a donation. So. Um, we said yes, of course, because we say yes to everything <laughs> that people uh, offer us. But um, we have worked with lobster hatchery type work in the past, so it was a good fit for us. And uh, so we were able to take that, um, accept that offer, and we use that as the starting point for this new facility. So we were, you know, trying to build something that, you know, you know, so that, you know, that fishing group that puts so much time and money and their effort invested into that, that hatchery project, um, just because they couldn't keep it going, well, then maybe we could. So we took it, we take it here and set it up. And then if that group or any other group needed to use it, then it would be here for them. And that's really the idea of what this funding is going to do. It's going to let us have facilities, upgrade our facilities, but also offer things within it for the industry that they can come and use themselves. Michelle is being much too modest in the, in the kind of work that she has been doing over the years here at the center and uh, the abilities that, uh, that where we are right now. And, uh, but it does go back, I think, as she mentioned, to, the, uh, to the, the gift of the hatchery. And you should ask the question, you know, why would the hatchery give us a gift? And the, the reason the Northumberland Fishermen's Association gave us a gift, I will suggest to you, is because they know us and because we need to get the word out about what we're doing here. And one of the things that I think Michelle has been very good at, and I'm coming at this relatively new. She's, she's the stalwart here of this institute, of this Centre for Marine Research. And what, she, what she's been able to do in gathering together people like the Northumberland Fishermen's Association and the Eastern... Uh, the Nova Scotia and Eastern Shore Fishermen's Association and other groups around is that she's been in contact with them and they've been in contact with her in terms of what we're able to do. And so when that gift comes across, it becomes an enabler for us. And, you know, as, as a, a helpful pen, which is all I can really claim to be maybe on these discussions, is to say that, look, there's a wonderful story here. There, there's all this work that can potentially go on to bring together uh, members of the industry in Nova Scotia and fisheries and aquaculture to, to do the kind of work that the lab can do uh, relative to a couple of buzzwords here, innovation and hubs and accelerators. Uh, the, these are things that we've encountered over, over the years that uh, are basically a way to describe what the Centre of Marine Research is doing here. And putting that together and presenting that, those buzzwords to a group like Invest Nova Scotia, I think it raises their, their attention. And we got their attention happily and uh, brought this forward. So the fact that uh, there was this gift in place, that uh, we've been doing this, Michelle and her team have been doing this work for, for these years, uh, and we've just kind of put a cap on it and said, this is what it looks like. This is what we really are, and we should let people know, more people know, outside the region, outside the, the rest of the province, to say, look, we're open for business, and we can help you do things. And uh, yeah, we're, we're all surprised. that I, I don't think we should be, but somehow we're surprised at the response to that, which has been positive to date, and which with this investment will continue and in terms of being able to do more with upgraded situations at the lab and our ability to, to do more training, offer more possibilities to in industry to help them do innovation. That's what this is about. It's to help industry uh, move further along, get a better value situation for, uh, for the province of Nova Scotia in fisheries and aquaculture. And it's fun. It's, it's uh, really fun for an old timer like me. I got to tell you, this, is, this has brought me back for, for years. And it's just, it's just great to watch and to see the interest that's being developed here. So it's, it's nice to be a part of this region and that going on. 
I mean, I think we put a wrapping on it, put a ribbon on it, if you will, and said, here's, here's what we're really doing in terms of what the modern uh, jargon is uh, around this. We're, we are a hub of innovation. We, we help accelerate an industry into doing new things and offering them that opportunity to do science through labs and experiments and training through the, the, the classrooms, et cetera, like you see here, that we're able to do. So I think that's wonderful. And I think, you know, pardon the pun here, but I think uh, Invest Nova Scotia, they bought it. They, they, they see, yeah, this, is, this makes good sense. We weren't trying to pull any wool over anybody's eyes. We were just putting it in a, a, a ribbon on it and... So, you know, that's where we are today. We should, be, we should be very pleased and we're looking forward. We've been, you know, doing a lot with very little. And, uh, you know, we don't try not to dwell on what we, what we didn't have, like access to seawater all the time, which is pretty important in what we do. But, be, for example, because we didn't have seawater access, we had to learn how to reuse the seawater that we had. So uh, by filtering it and cleaning it, and, uh, and that's like a specialized kind of field or technology. And so along the way, um, we ended up turning that into a positive because, you know, one of our biologists that works here, Alicia David, is now probably one of the most knowledgeable people in the province in terms of that technology for recycling seawater. This funding is, is helping us secure access to seawater, uh, secure like air temperature control spaces where we can really kind of fine tune what we do and it's not so much of a struggle to, to uh, run these experiments that we actually have ongoing. I interviewed Alicia David for the French language coverage of the Marine Research Centre that we're doing for our sister program, Notre Côté. When I asked Michelle Terrio if Alicia truly represents the kind of people that work at the Marine Research Centre, that come on board because of their interest but wind up staying and contributing for many years, Terrio responded with a resounding yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, she, like, you're talking to, you know, Dan and I today, but really there is, you know, a team behind us and uh, are with us. And it's a small team, but it is a very powerful team. And, you know, Alicia is one of those key people that's been here, you know, 10 years or more and uh, just really able, whatever it is that we're working on, really just able to, to learn about it and, and, you know, really master it. So uh, we've been very fortunate to have good, strong employees um, here with us. I, I think there's a lot of um, work that uh, Michelle's team, including Alicia and Victoria and Ron and, and everybody here uh, is doing around uh, the lobster fishery. And that takes a number of different forms. Uh, we have a sampling program in Southwest Nova that we, we lead uh, relative to the analysis of the data that comes in. You know, approximately 10,000 samples of lobster pre-season and in-season to take a look at uh, lobster quality and, and the work that they're doing there. That was a protocol that was developed and set up by the team here in part and uh, that we've been working on for, uh, for a number of years now. And um, I, I think that contributes to our discussion. And, and maybe I'll add this, that uh, one of the roles that I have here as part of that research work is as inter interim director of the Lobster Quality Research and Innovation Center. It's a, it's a side to the, to the, the, the Centre de Recherche Marine, the Marine Research Centre, the lab that, that uh, Michelle directs and runs here with her team. But uh, that component of the lobster work and associated with what goes on at the uh, Université Sainte Anne, Ciel uh, Social in, in, uh, in Church Point, the main campus, has to do with uh, that, uh, that work around lobster research on quality. That I must say, and I, I think this is important to note, that uh, in, throughout Canada, I can say, but certainly in the areas where we fish, uh, Homaris Americanus, American Lobster, uh, we're, we're probably the only uh, academic institution that's looking at the lobster quality issue from an academic pers perspective. In the aid to the industry, we're working very closely through this center, through the Lobster Quality Research and Innovation Center with industry, and developing uh, uh, the, the sampling methods and uh, working on quality issues about uh, predictions for quality for the industry. We're, we're looking at uh, investigating what happens in the supply chain of lobster from the sea to 
the client ultimately, and that client could be anywhere in the world. And so we're looking at what do we do with storage and handling and transportation and transshipment and air freight forwarding, all of those things. So that uh, that has taken up a lot of the, the, the time and effort that we're, we're doing here, including the work related to... Uh, you know, what goes on in the lab and how we, we do that there. So that's that's a big part of, I think, uh, some of the work that you mentioned. You, you know. Yeah, we do have several research projects going here, you know, at any one time. And that's, it's great right now that we have, you know, these strong projects and these funded projects. And, um, but that's been what we've, what we've always done here the last, we've been here about 15 years now for me, and uh, we've always been like self-funded. So we've always been, um, always had projects on the go that would help support us and support our center and the employees and, and all of that. So um, it's what we do, and uh, we're just happy right now that the focus is back. Uh, you know, me personally, I'm happy back that the focus is back on lobster, and that there has been a big push not just, you know, with our university, but across the province and across the Atlantic Canada for, uh, you know, work that helps to, you know, maintain quality in the lobster industry. So we're just part of a series of things and projects and activities that are happening right now to help support the lobster industry. So um, that part's very exciting, too. If you'd like to learn more about the Marine Research Centre at the Université Saint anne campus in Petit de Grand, Tune in to Talil's French language series, Not Côté, for a visit to this unique innovation center for the Atlantic seafood industry. And stay tuned to Talil 24-7 as we play the Fast Five game with Michel Terrio, the director of the Marine Research Center. And now, as we mentioned earlier, let's return our focus to autism and the celebration and acceptance of autism here at home and around the world with the support coordinator for the regional chapter of Autism Nova Scotia serving the Strait Area, Natalie Stevens. One of the big reasons we want to have you, of course, is because we just came off of some activities in Port Hawkesbury and in Richmond County on Saturday, World Autism Acceptance Day. And, of course, we are celebrating Autism Month during the month of April. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your organization, your portion of Autism Nova Scotia, and what it does in the area. So can you tell me a little bit to start off about how long the Strait Area Regional Council has been going and what geographical areas you cover? Uh, what do you folks do? So it's uh, Autism Nova Scotia Strait Area Chapter, and we have been around since 2014. Um, in 2019, we actually got our first office. It was just located in Port Hawkesbury in the McLeod Norway building, um, just a small little office. But in last year, in July, I moved us over to Mulgrave. So we are in the old school in Mulgrave. And we have a beautifully large office with a play space and we have access to the gym and the outside area there. So hoping uh, to start some programs in that location soon. COVID has kind of stopped us from doing a lot of in-person things, but I'm hoping that's shifting now. Um, but we do cover, uh, we're, I support Richmond, Guysboro, Anagan, uh, sorry, and uh, Inverness. So we are the Quad County. So you're really taking all that region in. How do you feel things are going in the individual regions in terms of your activities? Uh, because it really seems that Richmond is coming on stream uh, just in recent times. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about how things are going in terms of the activities you offer in these specific areas? So obviously Port Hawkesbury has always been big. We've been here for a while and seen in Port Hawkesbury specifically a lot. So my goal coming on was to try to get us known and seen in the other areas. So Richmond has been great. They've been uh, getting a lot more people from their area reaching out to me. Um, I've connected with the recreation department there. Uh, they've done the sensory skate at the arena this whole winter and last winter. Uh, I'm sure we're going to partner up for some more things. I know last uh, year when we did Autism Acceptance Month, the little gym in Arishat, little classes and sessions that uh, they, they donated some money back to us for it and promoted us. And then, of course, Warden Amanda Mumricat had no problem doing the flag raising ceremony. And we actually have a flag flying in St. Peter's. So uh, Richmond is, has been great. Um, Guysboro has been wonderful. Um, when we did our walk in September, 
I believe they had over 100 people walk in that area. Uh, we have some great, great families there that have been a huge uh, advocate for us. And the CLC has been fantastic. And I've just recently gotten in touch with some of the town councillors and they have our flag flying there as well. Um, having a little bit of a harder time breaking through in Inverness, but I finally have met some of the right people. So um, hoping, hoping to be seen a little more up in Inverness and Shetty Camp. Uh, we go right up as far as Pleasant Bay, like our chapter. So uh, hoping to get up in there. Uh, obviously, Port Hawkesbury has been fantastic. And I think the move to Mulgrave has opened up a few doors. And again, it's just been a little harder to get into, but uh, I'm only one person. I need some volunteers, some good <laughs> families that are advocating in their area that are able to help me open up some doors. But I've started to meet some people, some of the right people, and we've done a few events there now and, and just really hoping to get in there too. So I'm just kind of focused on where it's growing. So Richmond and Guysville right now are my focus. We're already seen a lot in Port Hawkesbury. So kind of moving through. I'll eventually get everywhere. It's a two-year goal. <laughs> I want to pick up on a point you made just a moment ago uh, talking about the sensory skate that happened at the Richmond Arena. And I understand that's happened at the Civic Centre as well in Port Hawkesbury too. Has that been the case? Yeah, we've done a few there as well. Um, I, I hopefully we'll get to do some more next year. But again, this year because of COVID, we haven't really done a lot. But I have, I was running a Learn to Skate program. Um, it was a six week, six week program. It just ended up, we just finished on Sunday actually. Um, and we'll do it again next year. So the Recreation Department for Hawkesbury, the town of Hawkesbury has been fantastic to partner with me so it's great you mentioned uh, that sensory skate program just wrapping up on sunday and on sunday the day after the flag raisings in port hawksbury and airshot uh, you folks also had uh, a special swim event at the street area pool uh, how did that go and, and what happens at those events that's a little different it was so much fun so we do a monthly we do a lot of family events and we do a monthly family event swim event at the straight area pool um right from september until june <clears throat> so it's every month it's posted on our Facebook page. Families can come. Um, those kids who come can bring a friend. So it's it's really nice. And this was the first time that that since I've been in this role that we got to use the obstacle course. Okay. So it was it I have so many videos to post, I still have to go through <laughs> them. But we had so much fun and I think the parents enjoyed watching the kids as much as everybody. And you'll hear me screaming a lot of names of encouragement. Um, but it was great. So now I want to do the obstacle course every time. I bring that up because I want to pick up on a point that you made talking about the sensory skate as well, too, and about uh, the activities that went on at the, the iFit Fitness Center in Arishat. Uh We've been speaking recently on Till Ill 24-7 with the head of the Arishat Community Development Association, Rochelle Sampson, about the new park that they're hoping to develop near Ecole Beauport, which is where the fitness center is. And they're putting a high priority on sensory-friendly activities at that park. And I want to springboard off that by asking you do you get the feeling that there's more awareness and more acceptance of the needs of the autism community especially where children are concerned in this area in the street in the in the general community since uh, the work started here uh, back in 2013 2014 do you think people are more aware of what needs to happen to be able to make uh, those with autism feel at home and feel safe i think that that the committees that they created this year on inclusive the inclusive committees that they've created i don't know exactly what they're called but i've been asked to speak uh to quite a few of their meetings about autism and about sensory issues and things like that. And I think that that um, actually has really opened up a lot of eyes um, because when people think of accessibility, that's what it is. Accessibility, they just think of somebody in a wheelchair or maybe somebody blind or deaf or, and they don't realize mm -hmm. that accessibility is also hidden disabilities and, and other types of disabilities. So I think that being able to talk with those members of, of the committees for those groups has been huge. And I think that those that committee has been wonderful in trying to make the changes. And I really do think that that has helped a lot. Um, but acceptance has definitely 
I don't even like been wonderful the last couple of years since I've started. I've only been here for 18 months in this role and um, I'm just meeting wonderful families and I'm meeting a lot of great advocates and have a lot of um, different professionals reaching out to me and asking what they can do and, and what. So I just, I think it's just a great thing that's happening right now. And that's, if every park and every school and every building and every place could you know, do what they need to do to adapt. That would be the dream. <laughs> and this is personal for yourself as well, too. You do have a daughter that is on the spectrum, and obviously you're doing this for far more than for her. But can you tell me about how she inspires you and how she motivates you to be able to keep doing this work for the Straight Area Regional Council of Autism, Nova Scotia? Oh, yeah, I'll talk about her all day long. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, so I, I didn't know anything about autism before I had a child with autism. Um, and she'll be 10 years old in July. And um, some days it's extremely hard and some days it's extremely easy and everything is different. And I just want her world to be as wonderful as it can be for her. And I have two nephews on the spectrum. Um, and they're a little bit younger than she is. And everything that I think about, I think about those three people and how I want their lives to be better. And then since meeting all these wonderful families that I know, I have, I know adults on the spectrum. I know newly diagnosed like three-year-olds and I just want their life to be wonderful. I want their, I want all of them to just live their best lives. So that's what I'm here to help hopefully improve and, and do and, and direct and guide them and support them in the best ways that I possibly can. Well, I know you and your committee have been working hard on that in the straight, but I also know, as you've brought up a couple of times now, that COVID-19 and the accompanying restrictions have made it hard for you folks over the last couple of years. And uh, you and I were talking just a couple of days ago about the big gathering. It was known as Walk the Walk for Autism, and I believe now it's known Walk Your Way for Autism. And you folks have struggled with that over the past couple of years and struggled with being able to offer your activities. Can you give me a look back at the difficulties that you've encountered, but also look ahead with some optimism in terms of being able to restore some of these programs and bring more awareness to autism in our region. Yeah, the walk is our biggest fundraiser. It's basically our only fundraiser to, for this area. I do a few small things throughout the year, but this is this is it. Um, the fundraiser allows us to have all of these wonderful family events and programs and things. So the more people we can get involved in the walk, the better. So it is now referred to, as you said, walk your way. So it went into a virtual walk um, two years ago where we just asked people to walk and take a picture and send it to us. And let us know you're walking and raise some money and, and whatnot. Last year, I picked five locations because we do cover the quad counties. I want a place to walk in every, at least in every county. So we had a walk in Antigonish, Guysboro, Fort Hawkesbury, Inverness, and St. Peter's. Uh, we do plan to do that same thing this year. Um, a lot of people were still coming off the end of COVID, so I don't know if a big gathering is the right thing to do. So I'm going to offer the five locations again. Well, we had a little rep there at the table passing out some T-shirts and, and uh, you know, just saying hi to the people that did come out. And we had quite a nice turnout at all Good. locations. Um, and we may do, we're calling it a hybrid event this year. So there might be, a, a, we might do a gathering in Port Hawkesbury. So anybody that wants to come and gather can gather and walk together. It'll still be outside. Um, hopefully it won't rain. And then we'll still offer the virtual, you know, here's the other locations you can walk in sure. and mm -hmm. just, you know, so I think we're kind of tweaking it a little bit. And I, and I feel it's really important to be seen in all of the areas that we cover. So I think that that's what we're going to continue going forward, having an event in one location, but then here's the opportunity to walk wherever you would like, which tends to walk your way. I wanted to bring you on partly so you could talk about what is happening, not only this month for Autism Acceptance Month, but also in the months to come for your organization. So what can you tell me that's happening that people can take part in? This month, um, we already had our swim, so but we do have another swim coming up on April 23rd. 
at the straight rich uh, straight area pool that one will not have the obstacle course but that's okay. okay we'll dive off the diving board it's all right so that's from, that's from 1 30 to 2 30. um and then i'm really excited that we have um seven fire stations that we're touring this month okay. i really wanted to get some community involvement in um, autism acceptance month so we're going to um, port hastings we're starting with port hastings on wednesday uh, we're in St. Peter's on Thursday, and then next week we're in Potlatech, and the week after Mulgrave, and we're in Shetty Camp, White Cogma, and Bolston. So I have that posted, that schedule posted on our Facebook page, mm -hmm. and uh, we're hoping to get some <clears throat> families out to the, the goal is that, of course, they see the fire trucks, because that's just fun. Uh, we'll have the lights going, but no sirens. We'll oh. ask if, if, if while we're there, the, the kids want to hear the siren and if nobody has any issues, we'll let them go. But if there's anybody that's nervous or scared, we won't turn them on. Um, but the firefighters are going to come out looking like we do. And then they're going to put their turnout gear on in front of the kids uh, for masks and everything. So mm -hmm. that the kids or, and, and adults, who uh, the individuals will see what they would look like in an emergency. So that they're not scared and they don't try to hide from them or don't run from them or whatever. So it's an education piece for the kids and for the families. Um, but then in May, we're going to turn around and go back to these fire stations and we're going to offer them an education session about autism so that they know how to react to an individual with autism during an emergency. So it's it, it's a two way street. They're going to they're going to give us some fun and, and some safety tips in April. And then we're going to go back in and talk to them in May. So okay, it's, it's good. I'm really excited about doing that partnership. With them. Um, and then we have last year, we did a scavenger hunt and it turned out really, really well. So we're going to do that again this year. So we have little rocks that we have painted blue and we have a little design on them and we're asking businesses. So businesses, I still don't have enough. So mm. listen up. <laughs> <laughs> I need them to participate. So yeah. what we do is we hide the rock outside of the business who's agreed to participate. And we put the challenge out to the community to go around and find the rocks. And they have to take a picture of the business that they found the rock at. There's going to be, there's 10 rocks. The goal is to have 10 rocks in each location. Um, and then they have to send me the pictures. And then for a full week, we post the pictures of all the businesses that participated and we post their logo and we talk about them and things like that. So they get a week long advertising. Um, it costs the business $25 to register. And then if they'd like to give me a donation that I can give out for prizes, I'll accept. Um, but I do have some gift cards and things right now. So last year it was fantastic. We had lots of people out hunting for these blue rocks and uh, the businesses that participated were wonderful. And uh, I'm hoping to, to get the same response this year. So I've got a few already, but we're still we're still working. So we're doing uh, St. Peter's, Port Hawkesbury, Aarschot, Guys Grove, yeah. and Shetty Camp. Are you looking beyond Autism Acceptance Month to programs that would be available later in the spring and in the summer? Yeah, so we do have an um, Art Day in May mm -hmm. already planned and scheduled. Um, I'll be posting about that. We, we usually post things about two weeks in advance so that people see it and it stays fresh in their mind. So um, Denise Benison, she's an art therapist and she works for um, NSEC, just the early intervention in New Glasgow. But she's coming down for a day and we're offering three sessions and she's doing some sensory play and she'll have some canvases and different types of paints and sands and things like that. Um, she'll have a goal of what she would like them to create, but there's lots of different things that they can create with. Um, and we're doing three different age groups. So we're doing school age, teenage and adult. So, and that'll happen on a Saturday and, and I'll be posting that soon. And then we're doing that same thing in June. We're doing a gardening day. So we'll, we're going to have, you know, all the supplies you need for your seeds and gardening and same thing, same age groups to come and, create some solariums and things like that. Um, and then we also have our swims and I have a swim at in St. Avex in May as well. Okay. Um, and then I booked a few things for the summer, which we don't 
often do, but I was so excited about doing these, and, and I haven't told anybody yet, so I'll announce it here. Um, oh, great. Let her in. Yeah. So we booked the Marjorie River tubing for August 27th. Oh, so I booked up to 25 people right now, but I can have up to 50, and I feel like I'll have up to 50. Um, and then I booked, this is the most exciting thing ever. So I have booked Camp Rankin for the weekend to uh. take family camping in August. So I just I just tied that all up last week, and, and it's going to be awesome. I think we'll be able to take six or seven families camping for the weekend, and that's going to be so much fun. Um, and then, of course, we're going to partner with Mulgrave again this year for our summer camp. So they, they run a summer camp through their recreation department. And last year, we partnered with them to make their camp more inclusive. So we'll be partnering with them again this year. And possibly, I'm in the works of trying to partner with Fort Hawkesbury for their summer camp as well. So lots going on. Oh, that's wonderful. You sound very busy. And if people want to find out more about this, you've mentioned the Facebook group. Uh, can you give me the exact name of the Facebook group and any other way that you'd like to promote for people to get in touch with you and your organization? Sure. So as you go on Facebook and you type in Autism Nova Scotia Straight Area Chapter, you will find us. Uh, we do have a website, but it's being tweaked right now. So I haven't really been putting a lot on the website. Um, and they can always just call me my number. All my information is on that Facebook page. But um, they, a lot of people reach out mostly. Facebook is really my biggest way to reach people. Um, they can email or, or call as well. And all that information is on the Facebook page or on our website. We've covered a lot of ground, Natalie, and I appreciate you giving me some time here this morning. Did you want to add anything else just before we wrap it up? No, I just I really love that you gave me this time because... As I said, I still feel like I haven't reached every family and every person I could reach. And this gives me an opportunity to be seen. So I thank you tremendously for that because I really want to reach them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's our pleasure. And we wish you well throughout the rest of Autism Acceptance Month and through the rest of the summer with the programs. Uh, Natalie Stevens, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Adam. Have a good day. You too. Natalie Stevens is the support coordinator for the Straight Area Regional Council of Autism Nova Scotia. We've been speaking to her at her home via Zoom. Stay tuned for more of Tell Ill 24-7 in just a moment. And now, as promised earlier, here's our latest edition of the Tell Ill 24-7 Fast Five, featuring the director of the Marine Research Centre for Université St. Anne and Petit de Gras, Michelle Theriot. First question, coffee, tea, or neither? Oh, coffee, absolutely. Dream vacation. Oh, that's a good one. Probably, now I'd have to say somewhere down south, somewhere warm. Ah. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long winter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, too long, I would say. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, that's uh, something we're all dreaming right now. You can be one animal for a day. What is that animal? Oh, I love dogs, so probably some kind of dog. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. There we are. Do you have dogs, by the way? Yes, I have two dogs, yeah. So you'd want to be one of your dogs so your dogs could spoil you for a day? Yeah, it's kind of weird when you think of it that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're all about kind of weird here at the Fast Five, yes. All right. Would you rather be a forest or a tree? Hmm. Um, a tree. A tree? A tree. Why a tree? Um, I'm not really sure. I can't imagine... Uh, just an individual thing, I guess. And last question on the Fast Five. Does ketchup go on hot dogs? Sure. You got through the Fast Five. Congratulations, Michelle. <laughs> oh, thank you. Michelle Terrio is the director of the Marine Research Center here at Université saint anne in Petit de Gras, and she is the latest victim, a uh, volunteer of the Telil 24-7 Fast Five. And that wraps up this week's edition of Telil 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my interview guests this week, Michelle Terrio, Daniel Lane, Natalie Stevens, and Amanda Mumbercat. If you have any comments on what you've seen over the past hour, or you'd just like to suggest future ideas for Tale Ill 24-7, I'd be very happy to get them from you. You can contact me directly, or you can contact Tale Ill Community Television in Arishat, and don't forget to follow Tale Ill on social media. I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for tuning in to Tell Ill 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.